Um, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Devanshi. I'm a master's candidate in comparative literature at um, New York University or NYU. I also finished my bachelor's um, from NYU in literature with a minor in creative writing. Um, I specialize in Italian studies and I'm from Bhopal, India, but um, I live in New York now. Um, and uh, yeah, so besides that, I'm um, just working in Italian studies and I'm also a distance runner. Arjun? Hello everyone. I'm Arjun. Uh, I'm currently studying at Georgia Tech, majoring in computer science. It's my second year and I have received faculty honors in my first year. I currently am interested in drama and startups and I've joined clubs for the same at the university. Uh, thank you guys. So uh, without further ado, we're gonna move into our topic of discussion. Before uh, we do that, I really request everyone to uh, please keep their mics uh, on mute and uh, drop in any questions they have in the chat feature. And if there are any questions that you want to, uh, like you want to personally ask, you can wait towards the end where we're gonna have an open-ended discussion for about 20 minutes. Uh, so moving on to the topics of discussion, Devanshi, let's begin with you. Could you please briefly tell us your uh, application story uh, to NYU and other universities? What do you think played an important role? What did not work for you? And uh, some unique points, please. Um, yeah, so I think that I, I came from Bhopal and uh, nobody from my school had ever applied um, to study abroad in the United States before. Um, so I was essentially the first one. Um, and um, I think that I was very fond of creative writing, but did not have anyone in my family or around me who was into poetry. I also wanted to study Italian and specialize on this one particular writer. So I knew from a very young age that I wanted to write a thesis on her and I want to specialize on her. And the only professor at that point who was teaching a class on that writer was at NYU. Um, so I had actually emailed the professor uh, back when I was maybe in ninth or 10th grade that I'm interested in applying to NYU. I've read your book, I've read your work, I really love it um, and I want to apply. So I think that she had and other professors um, had actually, I'd, I'd been contacting professors at Harvard and other universities that I was interested in. And then they all gave me a tour um, and asked me to come to the United States. So I actually got a tour of the universities and the departments from the professors before applying for undergrad when I was 15 or 16. Um, and then I think that it gave me a really good view of a department specific approach. Um, and that's how I got down to um, applying to universities. I attended um, writing workshops at the University of Iowa and Virginia before. Um, and I had also started my own literary journal and magazine um, and my own sort of literary club and society um, in Bhopal. Um, so I think that those things definitely helped. I, um, was also working on a poetry collection at that point that got published while I was in college. Um, so I think that all of those kind of factors of being a self-starter, um, but as, at the same time, knowing the faculty very intimately and being in touch with them um, throughout um, really helped me get into NYU and other universities that I had applied to. So, so just to sum it up, you think that uh, what got you through NYU was major specific activities and the fact that you already knew the admissions team and you went there, you know, shared your story with them. So it gave a face value to your application. Yes. Um, and I also um, sort of just very, I, I knew very clearly my reason for applying to NYU was that I could take these five classes, work with these three scholars and, um, what I wanted to do. So I had a very specific reason for applying. Right, right. perfect. Uh, Arjun, moving on, uh, what do you think played a very integral role in your application process and what did your application journey uh, look like? The primary factor that played a major role in my application was a story I built around myself. To me, College application is more about 
this image you create of yourself in front of uh, any person any stranger that you don't know and that's 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 the most important thing for me okay perfect and and what do you think worked for you what do you think did not work for you how did you you know brainstorm that story out uh, while addressing your common app essay as far as brainstorming is concerned i feel it's best to do it with your best friend or your family your father mother brother do they feel they they give you ideas about yourself or your personality traits that even you might not be aware of and that's something that a stranger should know about you that those are things that someone likes about you and that's what that's what's most important in an application right so basically basically uh, you feel that your uh, close relatives your family and your friends know you from a different angle that you might not have explored yourself in right yeah exactly exactly perfect uh devansh the podium is all yours with the same questions yep uh so for the same uh, for the admission story um i actually started my process pretty late as compared to most of the students i started my process in the month of july during my uh, 12th grade and um, so uh, something unique about me was that um, so i studied sciences in the grades 11th and 12th and i ended up at the business school and honestly i think i applied to 52 colleges all over the world and out of which i think four or five were business schools the rest of them were engineering schools just because of my background and <clears throat> i was uh, decent at sciences so that's what um, my parents thought would be good for me because i was honestly very confused at that moment and then something just tried out and i decided that i want to uh, major in uh, business and like go to a business school and it's working out pretty well up until this point um a uh, second part would be like important uh, like applications will be extra curriculars for me and the essays because i feel essays is a, a part of the real estate of the application which is all yours you can um, like maneuver it any way you want and the stories that you tell through your essays are extremely important since uh, as arjun rightly mentioned that it gives a greater insight to the person who's reading an essay into your life or maybe into your personality and that is how they i think uh, deem fit like they think that okay you will fit into the culture of the university or not and things like that um unique about my application i think i've already mentioned this earlier but i uh, really uh, like leveraged my background of sciences and technology in high school uh, in my college applications while i was uh, applying to business schools because uh, there are a lot of kids applying to business schools but a lot of them with a tech background and uh, going into uh, the intersection between business and tech and so that's something which set me apart or was something uh, of a stand out uh, feature uh, on my application Uh, so, so, so you think it did not play a disadvantage that uh, you wanted to, like I mean, you pursued uh, engineering in your high school and then you applied for a business degree. Do you think uh, that was some reason why you might have been rejected from some places because it was totally unrelated? I feel uh, yes, uh, definitely. Like if we look at it from that point of view, it had something to do with it, uh, with my techni- uh, technology background. But I feel it's the story and how you display it that matters and. Uh, honestly my extra curriculars were more oriented towards technology but i started uh, how do i like i started defining it in uh, the terms of a business point of view which uh, made them i won't say perfectly fit that those were the best extra curricular activities but they somewhat fit into the business criteria and made me stand out at the same time they weren't perfect but they helped me stand out at the same time right right so 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 uh, that basically delves uh, us into our next question as to how important extracurricular activities are but before that arjun i have a question for you i know you're a computer science major we have a question in the chat box as to what components of your application would be ranked the highest when you're applying for a computer science degree so could you please answer that right so uh, as far as the computer science application goes it's pretty much the same as any other application because in the us the process is a holistic process right you are not ranked according to your major 
So most applications are ranked on the same basis in most schools. Now it varies from school to school a bit, but in most schools you'll find that a computer science ap uh, applicant is as, as par with a applicant in say the business or any other field, unless you're applying to a specific school. But obviously knowing a bit about computer science, even if you don't have computer science, it's fine. You need to know, you need to have logic building skills because end of the day, computer science is not about computer science or coding as such. It's more about the math and the logic behind it. So if you could demonstrate your logical skills and mathematical skills in your application, that would be great. Right. Thank you so much, Arjun. And I think that part would be covered more through your extracurricular activities. So, so both these examples that Devansh gave and Arjun gave were basically, uh, you know, people who are doing a totally unrelated major. Like Arjun said, you don't need to have computer science uh, in, in your like in your high school. And uh, how did they get accepted into these universities was because of their extracurriculars. So my next question is for Devansh. How important is extracurriculars uh, for US and uh, especially during this pandemic? I think um, I'll start off by like defining something like, okay, so your academic focus or your academic uh, strengths could be only showed by, showed by your grades. And similarly, your um, traits like your logic and uh, maths, as Arjun mentioned, like maths is a subject I agree, but like logic and everything would be shown through your extracurricular activities and the things that you're involved in. Extracurriculars, I feel, are an important part in defining your personality to the college as well because um, there are a lot of times when you are mentioning incidences or uh, situations or like the whole journey related to the extracurricular activity onto your essay which is where it might help you more and apart from that extracurricular activities just defines the kind of culture and uh, the upbringing like the kind of a thought process that you have developed over the years and you could uh, definitely talk about why you were interested in a particular extracurricular activity, maybe onto your essay or on the common app activity section while you're mentioning it. Uh, even though like that's, that's something that I've never seen being done, but I've heard people do it. Um, apart from that, uh, I feel that like all the top universities require somewhat, I won't say require, but I uh, feel that um, if somebody is at the top of their field in extracurricular activities, it just shows how passionate and how focused they are about a certain thing, which can definitely help out. Right, uh, perfect. Devanshi, what are your thoughts on the on the same? I mean, I completely agree with, with Devanshi that uh, like, you know, focused activities would definitely show uh, a lot of interest towards your intended major in college. But uh, do you think even unrelated activities play an integral part or no, because I know for a fact that a lot of counselors, especially I mean, my counselor as well, uh, you know, asked me that we should go, uh, uh, you know, for, uh, like run a blog or uh, go to river rafting, which is totally unrelated for my major in my college. And I, I know it did not help me a lot. Um, yeah, I think that I shared the same perspective. And I think that it has changed from applying from undergrad to graduate school for me, because I think that my extracurriculars in undergrad um, or for my undergrad application looked very different. They were very focused towards my major. I um, was not good at anything basically besides literature and writing. Um, but when I was applying to graduate school for my master's at NYU, I actually put running and cooking as um, like things that have informed my view of, of Italian studies um, because I said how Italian cooking has changed my view of the culture and my studies and what I'm writing my thesis on. Um, and at the same time, how marathon running or training for a marathon has changed me uh, completely. Um, so I think that for me, when I was writing my application uh, or my essay, I decided to focus on different things other than my, my major and my studies. Um, and I was applying one, one of the graduate schools that I was applying to, my, my department already knew me as a student. So I was like, what, uh, what other thing about me do they not know? What do my professors not know me as? Um, so I was trying to, again, tap in on the, on the things that my professors and my departments do not know about me um, to sort of say how they qualify me as um, a candidate for my master's studies and have informed my 
my my viewpoints and my own self um, in a different way because I think after a certain point you are supposed to be a more holistic person and actually show the development um, from especially from in my case from undergrad to graduate school. So yeah. Right. Right. So so uh, I mean I just got a point over there where you were talking about uh, how you related uh, running. I mean so cooking it, uh, Italian food to actually pursuing a, a degree in that in college. So, so definitely uh, relating anything and everything with your intended major in college, so this is for the audience, would uh, definitely score you into a good university because uh, if you do something that is unrelated, totally unrelated to your application, then that then you're just using up uh, like you know one or two pages of space and you're just wasting it because that's what you have for your resume, that's what you have for your essays. So please put activities that are totally related to your major and try elaborating on those activities. For example, like Devanshi said, she related cooking Italian food to how, uh, you know, she related that to culture, the Italian culture, and that's why she wanted to pursue that in her essays, right? So de definitely stating that in your resume will not help you as long as you don't justify it. Um, so, so Arjun, uh, moving on to the next topic. Uh, I know you had a 1540 in your SAT. Could you please give, a, give our audience a little bit uh, more uh, insights and some tips as to how they should go about uh, taking these exams? I think the most important thing about SAT is, is practice. I mean, you need to know where you are in your journey. So if you're not started anything, you should first give a practice test or something. And then you see, then see where you stand. Then you need to identify concepts where you are lacking. You could give two, three papers and identify patterns, especially in math, English too. Once you identify that, you need to start working on those. There are many practice uh, sheets and there are many practice, uh, much, there's much, many practice material on uh, these books and all. So you can go there and practice more and then give the same thing again. Now, if that does not work out, then you can look for strategies online. So how to approach a certain kind of paper or how to approach this kind of question. And that will really help you boost your score. Perfect. As far as English is concerned, I think you should read a lot also. Apart from the normal SAT practice uh, reading tests, you should give uh, some time to reading books or American literature or something that really builds your uh, acumen for that kind of reading. And then you'll be able to read faster probably in these tests. Uh, perfect. So, so we have a question in the in the chat box uh, saying how long uh, did it uh, you know take you to prepare for the SAT? So uh, I mean, Arjun, you can answer. I don't have a specific timeline, but I think I prepared for a month or so. Uh, did they want but to? First attempt was 1530 and my second attempt was 1540. Right. So, so Devansh, would you like to, uh, like to elaborate on this? And I mean, I know for a fact that you've helped a lot of students with the middle life get into uh, universities and score well as well. So uh, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I think coincidentally, or my thoughts are exactly the same as Arjun. I, recommend all my students uh, firstly start off with a lot of material and practice something which is very necessary and secondly I feel practice my motivation or my thoughts behind practice are a bit different honestly because I think that uh, practice helps you figure out what strategies are working for you and what are not so there are certain strategies mentioned on the book like process of elimination and things like that but they don't necessarily obviously work for, they always work for you. So you need to figure out a strategy which will work for you a greater amount of times and has some, and then you need to make sure that you're comfortable with the strategy by practicing it out. So finding strategies, I feel YouTube and the general videos available online are an amazing um, asset and resource for uh, everyone um, available. Like, uh, for each and every student because they are free and easy to use. So, uh, yeah, that's my opinion, SAT. Right. 
Right. So, so uh, actually, this is another question that Lavanya has asked that how uh, did you prepare for the reading section? Before uh, we jump on to that uh, with Devanshi, uh, I'd like to answer something uh, differently. So, uh, I believe that you at least need two to four months of practice. And the more you practice, the better you score. Because personally, for me, I had an 1120 SAT uh, in my first attempt, and then I finally got a 1520. So, that 400 point jump was when I took some coaching, definitely. But along with that, I practiced and practiced. I practiced like 45 practice tests. And with every single practice test, I could see that uh, it probably would have increased like a 10 or a 15 point jump for me. So, uh, so, so that is totally uh, like, that is another strategy that you can follow is, uh, which is practice. Um, now, uh, moving on to the question, how did you prepare for the reading section? Devanshu, would you like to answer that? Um, yeah, I think that um, for me, um... I mean, I, I was reading a lot um, anyway, because I was into literature. Um, I would suggest reading definitely The Atlantic magazine and The New York Times, um, because I think those are the two journals from which they actually take a lot of the SAT content. Um, so I would recommend that. And there's also another portal called Eon, um, A-E-O-N dot uh, co. Um, they publish three articles every day um, in different disciplines, um, psychology, science, society, literature. Um, and I think that those really help uh, because that is the kind of writing that um, not only you're supposed to do in college and that you learn, but that also comes in the SAT. And because it's from different disciplines, I think it's important to read stuff from different disciplines. Um, so I would actually, um, while preparing for the SAT, started reading the Economic Times that you get in India from front page to last page, because I think that's a wonderful newspaper um, to actually get to build that sort of um, holistic view of what reading and writing can be from different disciplines. And um, I think just to add to the test preparation, I, I also um, studied, started preparing for the test very early on. So I actually um, took the test once in 10th grade and then once in 11th grade. Um, and so I was preparing for six to eight months for the SAT. But what I did was that I replicated test conditions at home. So I would um, sort of be at home. I would ask no, but I would ask everyone to not disturb me. I would have just a bottle of water, um, some snacks that I was actually going to take to the test. Um, and I would start the test at the same time. Um, and I had sort of changed my entire schedule in the days leading up to the test so that my best concentration or that my, um, my body clock was oriented according to the time that I was taking the test. So I think that those kinds of physical um, mental factors um, also play a role. So definitely try to replicate um, test conditions at home um, and um, take as many practice tests in those replicated test conditions um, as much as possible. I would say at least 10. So, yeah. Thank you, Devanshi. There's another question actually, uh, and I'm keeping the podium open, uh, but I think both Devanshi and uh, uh, Devanshi would be able to answer this best because they've helped students and they've received this kind of aid. So do the, uh, so Ananya is asking, do the standardized tests play a huge role in determining the amount of financial aid or scholarships uh, when it comes to applying to universities? Devanshi, would you like to go first? Uh, you can go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So as far as my knowledge goes, uh, yes, they do because I feel that uh, like the standardized scores are basically a cutoff for the amount of financial aid that you would be receiving. And um, I have personally seen this as well that um, so your standardized score plus the time that you're applying at in the college make a big impact on the financial aid uh, or the scholarship that you're receiving because it's a fairly simple logic that the earlier you apply, the more amount of scholarship pool you will get into. And since uh, it'll be more, there's a higher probability that you'll be able to score the X, Y, Z amount of scholarship that you are aiming to get in. And the later you apply, the uh, pool gets lowered because they start distributing the scholarship money. And then uh, you'll have lower chances of uh, getting the scholarship. And as I mentioned earlier, just to reiterate that, that standardized tests are essentially a cutoff for the financial aids or the scholarships. 
Yeah, I think that for me, uh, I'm not sure if it, um, because my standardized test results in reading and writing were very high, but in math, they were not, um, my SAT reports. Um, and I think that I personally think that I got it because I was um, into literature. I had done a lot of prestigious writing workshops. Um, I was very serious about writing from a very early age. Um, so I think that for me that, and, and also there was a, a, a explicit financial need on my part that I couldn't attend university if I was not given financial aid. Um, so I think that for me, it was um, a combination of all of those factors. Um, and maybe even the fact that nobody from my school had ever applied to the US before for undergrad uh, studies. So um, I think that for me, it was the other um, things besides my academics um, that, you know, maybe just my, my profile, who I was. Um, I had done a lot of solo traveling from a very young age. So I think that also worked in my favor that I was kind of very well acquainted with um, a multicultural setting. So um, I think for me, it was be everything besides standardized tests, I would say that worked in my favor. Great, perfect. Uh, so so there's, there's another question in chat, which says, does AP scores help uh, in getting financial aid? And I'd like to answer that and then anyone can just join me if they want to. So uh, basically uh, I've given this example on and off to a lot of students that imagine there are two pieces of land and imagine yourself to be, uh, you know, an investor land there's land a and there's land b for land a you know 10 people who are investing for land b you know 100 people who are investing which land would you invest in i'm sure land b because you you know more more people are investing you're more comfortable with, with the kind of people who are investing in that land it's same when it comes to college admissions the admissions counselor sitting in the us does not know what a 95 percent in dpsr paper means what a 42 in the dune school in the ib board means what three a stars in some school following the cambridge board means what a 97 in some state board maharashtra state board or kerala state board means or what some other uh, you know uh, academic score at some other country means when you're applying abroad to an international country you are all viewed in the southeast asian pool of students that includes south koreans that includes chinese that includes uh, Sri Lankans, Bangladeshi, Pakistanis, Indians. So, so that is why to determine as to which applicant is better than the other, these standardized tests play a very important role. Yes, APs play a very important role. If you haven't given APs, you can still look at uh, different Olympiads, look at different online courses to show your academic competence. Yes, extracurriculars do matter a lot as well, but why standardized tests play an equally important role is because uh, you know of the simple fact that they help you uh, bag good scholarships and help, uh, you know, and after all, you're going to a college to study, not for not to have fun, not to do extracurricular activities. So if you're not academically competent, why would Harvard, why would Yale, why would Stanford want to accept you? Right? Uh, we have another question. Uh, I mean, does anyone have any other points to that? Time in just a minute. So um, I like to take myself as an example. Um, I took four APs and scored five in all of them. And I ended up with 14 credits at Indiana University, which is roughly a semester. Uh, and after that, like after taking a extensive course load, I'm able to graduate a year early. So I won't say that I, I in like directly converted into a scholarship, but I am indirectly converting in, into a scholarship by saving one years of um, academic expenses and the living expenses associated with it. And apart from that, I am getting another year in my uh, career. Uh, perfect. So Arjun, I have a question for you. Uh, how do you choose between taking the SAT or the ACT? Sorry, I didn't get that. So, so how would you choose between, uh, you know, taking, do you want to take the SAT? Should I take the ACT? Because, because ideally both the exams uh, are, are viewed as one, as same, right? Right. So uh, the best way to, way to choose between SAT and ACT is uh, by giving a test, a practice. So give a few tests of both, see where you score well, give the one you score well in. It's as simple. People say ACT is a bit more science inclined. I mean, if you want, uh, because it has a smaller English section and there's a science section as well. I mean, it's it works for some people, it does not work for some people. It totally depends on you. 
another thing to consider between the sat and act is that act has gone online whereas sat is still on paper so if you're not comfortable with the online version i would say give sat but if you prefer online then obviously go with the act perfect uh, thank you any other comments from uh, our panelists or uh, should i move on to the next question perfect uh, so the next topic of discussion is essays so i think we've already discussed uh, a little bit about uh, your experience in you know uh, how you tackled uh, the you know brainstorming the common app essay and and writing and uh, devanshi i'd uh, like to give you the mic and uh, could you please like briefly explain as to uh, what were some key points uh, with deciding okay this is the point out of my resume or this is what i want to write about uh, for my story um yeah i think that for me it was um what um i think i during one of the the writing workshops that i taken at the university of iowa we actually had an admissions officer from university of pennsylvania come and give like an overview of um admissions and applying to us universities and he said write about the most interesting fact about yourself and he gave us 30 seconds to think about the most interesting fact about ourselves um and my interesting fact was that i own a 16th century copy of the bible but written in ancient greek um so that's what i wrote my essay on it was the most interesting fact about myself um and um i wrote about how i had actually found it on the roadside at the university of cambridge um and then i actually found the person who it belonged to who was 102 at the time um and sort of um like traced how he got it and who the ownership was who in 1632 owned it and i did it with the help of the faculty of classics at cambridge university so i was contacting professors archives trying to find out who did it belong to how did this book travel and get to this um old professor living um in cambridge um so my essay was all about tracing um like how I landed the book, um, how I found out about it, how I found out it was written in ancient Greek. I didn't know what ancient Greek looked like. Um, so that was my essay. It wasn't anything on my resume. It was just, this is the most interesting fact about myself. And it revealed things like I love to travel. I love exploring different cultures. Um, I love finding out, I love research. Um, I am into literature, history, culture, um, all of those things that I'm basically doing now. Um, so I think that if you choose the most interesting fact about yourself, um, it is going to be the most interesting fact about yourself. Um, so I think that's just what I wrote on and it was the easiest thing I ever had to write or the easiest story I ever had to tell. So, yeah. Thank you, Devanshi. Uh, Devanshi, I have a question for you. So, so I, I'm seeing a lot of comments as to, you know, I've scored this in my exam and I've scored this in my 11th. Am, am I good enough to get into a university? So, uh, Audience, I want to tell you that uh, Devansh has uh, counseled a lot of students for us. And uh, there's this one particular case, I'll not take his name. He had a 65% and three years of gap year where he failed flying school three times. Devansh, uh, what university did he get, get into? And uh, why do you, uh, you know, like what played a very important role uh, in his application process? Okay, um, I would like to uh, firstly define things a bit better now. Uh, so the application process closes on uh, January 1st or December 31st. I interacted with the client for the first time. I think I remember it was December 28th. And um, as uh, uh, Vishesh mentioned that uh, we uh, he had a bit of a unique past and it was interesting to work with him. Uh, the things that worked for him were his essays. Uh, because he had so much experience as a person applying to college. People, I think you might have heard that, okay, take a gap year and explore the world. That might help you in your college applications and define yourself in a better manner. He had done that so very well. He knew exactly what he wanted. So we didn't spend a lot of time brainstorming, but um, his essays were something that were a class apart since we had so much of experiences to share about his flying school, his uh, failures, how he succeeded, 
um, how he was working uh, side by side as he was working in uh, as he was studying in the flying school, how he managed to uh, save enough money to take the tests again and again for the flying school just because he was so passionate about becoming a pilot and uh, riding a plane. Uh, so yeah, uh, essays are like this particular example. I think is good enough to show how important essays are. His academics were not very good and essays helped him define uh, uh, his personality. Um, I Sorry, I forgot to mention where he got in. He got into uh, the Indiana University Bloomington at the Kelly School of Business where I'm currently studying. Um, it's a top 10 business school. Uh, so uh, I think he uh, outdid himself because I that was frankly a dream university for uh, a person with uh, that kind of a profile and the essays helped him uh, achieve it. Perfect, thank, thank you very much. So so again, in chat box, we're having, actually I completed my 12th, uh, will I be accepted into universities like Stanford, Harvard? Does gap year affect admissions in any regard? I, I would say yes and no. As long as you can define the gap year, like what you, you've done something concrete with that gap year, it will not matter, but if you've not done anything concrete and just idled, uh, idled away watching Netflix or you know uh, on social media, then yes, it will definitely affect you a lot. Uh, in, in the case of a student that you uh, this that uh, Devanch is talking about, so that student basically did flying school for three years. So he did not idle his time away. He was he actually invested it in one of his interests that he had. So so it will definitely not affect uh, as much as long as you can justify it. What do you think, uh, Arjun? Like, does gap year uh, actually like make a difference? It depends on whether you are ready to explore what you want to explore and whether you have the opportunity to explore what you're interested in. So if you don't have the opportunity or if you feel that you feel stuck when you're taking a gap year, then don't take a gap year. Otherwise, a gap year is a wonderful time for you to really explore yourself. I mean, you don't have the burden of this exam or that exam or that deadline. You make your own schedule in that gap year completely. So I would say take it if you're ready for it. Perfect. Uh, thank you Arjun, uh, for the advice. So, so even for me, uh, I did not take a gap year at the beginning of my college, but uh, before my fourth year, so I should have graduated by now. But I actually took a gap year, not just because of the pandemic, but because I wanted to explore, uh, you know, what my family business is about and how, like, what classes can I take to actually uh, address the issues within my family business better. So often students do that before college, before deciding a major. Well, often, like, like as Devan said, he had engineering, but he found his passion for business. He did not take a gap year for it, but often students do take a gap year for it. Um, there's another question by Ananya and Sakshi, and they're talking about uh, if they have not given the SAT and or, or like the APs, would it matter uh, with regards to your application? Uh, Ananya, can you mute yourself and just uh, rephrase your question because this is a little confusing. Oh, sure, sir. Yeah. yeah. Good evening, everyone. So I wanted to ask that I haven't appeared for the APs this year and I am planning to appear for an English proficiency test and the SAT. So if I haven't taken the APs, will that adversely affect my application or do the good scores or good test scores make up for it? So, so, so definitely if uh, you've not taken the APs, it would not matter as much because they happen only once a year. And this year uh, it kind of happened, uh, happened very haphazardly. You can, you can take uh, some online courses, you can take some Olympiads, uh, you can even give the SAT or the ACT uh, along with the English proficiency test to uh, show your academic inclination and competence. Uh, moving on to Sakshi, she has a, a question if the GPA is 3.9 or, or less than four, uh, do we need to give uh, SAT uh, due to the pandemic conditions? I mean, will our application get affected? Uh, Devanshi, would you want to address this? Um, so this is, um, I think that, um, I think that it's, if, if it's a pandemic year, I personally think having applied to graduate school during a pandemic year, I think that, um, I, I don't think that they're actually giving, um, as much weightage to, um, SATs. Uh, that's my general view that they're not giving as much weight weightage to, um, 
these sort of testing conditions that we cannot determine or that are not safe at this point. Um, I think that what um, will or will not affect, or even like your GPAs, because universities have changed and relaxed a lot of views around um, how grading is going, et cetera, and maybe schools too um, have done that. I think that what matters, again, is focusing on what you can control, which is essays, um, which is maybe um, talking about your resumes and writing the, the general aspects of your application. What can you do with your time? So I think that how much it will or will not affect um, your application, um, testing or GPAs at this point and in this year um, due to pandemic conditions, um, I think that that's just something students cannot control. Um, it's controlling them. So I would rather focus my energy and my all my anxieties on um, what I can control. Uh, perfect. So, so we're having a lot of questions in chat and I, I'd like to keep that for the uh, discussion towards the end. Uh, so let's move on to the next topic and, and I assure you guys, even if uh, the panel cannot answer this today because of the lack of time, uh, you can always log on to uh, unirely.com and you will find help over there. Okay, just search Unirely College Counseling on Google. Uh, moving on to scholarships and financial aid, and I, I know that a lot of uh, people have this particular question. Uh, so briefly, I'll explain you the difference between scholarship and financial aid. Scholarship is when you simply take a, a, you know, a, a question on your common app, are you looking for scholarships? Vishesh, yes, no. There is no other additional forms that you need to submit, but when you're applying for financial aid, uh, you have to submit the CSS profile, which is basically an extensive financial document containing your sponsors, uh, uh, like income, your family expenditure, how much is your savings, and why you cannot afford the uh, premium tuition at Harvard. And that's when uh, uh, these universities would basically uh, weigh the pros and cons and decide whether to match your scholarship requirement. So let's say if you say that uh, I want a 40% financial aid from Harvard and Harvard cannot match your uh, financial aid requirement, they're gonna reject you outright. However, if let's say you are applying to Harvard with a simple yes on your common app essay saying that, yes, I'm looking for scholarships, Harvard might accept you, might reject you, might accept you with a 20% scholarship, might accept you with a 60% scholarship. So the amount is not defined, right? Um, uh, Arjun, uh, so I, I know you haven't received a scholarship uh, at, at GIT, but uh, if you, I'm sure your friends have. So what helped them get you know, a scholarship uh, in, at GIT? Hey, so, uh... I mean, it was talked about earlier. The most important thing was in scholarship is I think the SAT score, obviously. And apart from that, some universities, they have a separate essay for giving out scholarships and, uh, you know, different application for scholarships. So in those applications, probably writing the essays as seriously as you write the essays for your university admissions is important because many people, they just take those essays lightly as in when they get into the, into the university. I mean, I did that I did that with a few universities that applied to. So you need to keep that in mind. As far as financial aid is concerned, it's obviously totally based on your need. So it's not in your control. Perfect. So, so I think for both, you would need a, a very strong extracurricular, like a very strong resume. But along with it, you would need very insightful essays and good academics. So for, for either, be you targeting for scholarships or financial aid. So Devanshi, you received a 100% uh, scholarship from NYU. Uh, like, tell us, I mean, uh, what your journey was and how did you receive that scholarship and what about your application do you think made you back that? Um, yeah, so I filled out the CSS financial um, form. I um, also used the extra space to um, explain why I might need um, financial aid in order to attend NYU. And I think that um, for me, what definitely helped was um, um, not not exactly I, I not exactly my scores, um, but I think that definitely my um, my academic approach and my academic goals and what I wanted to do. I also made it very clear in my undergrad application that I do wanna get a PhD. I do wanna do masters. I am looking forward to education being a very continuing part of my, my, my life. Um, and, and I think that that also played a role. Um, and um, I think just in general, um, 
as as and another thing just to keep in mind is that I kept getting more scholarships while I was at NYU. So whether that was because I did very well academically, so they gave me more scholarship, they gave me more research funds, they gave me more funding for my tech needs because I said I need a better laptop um, to do research. So you know they would wire me money for that, um, etc. So I think that it's just um, working on. Um, a lot of research and doing very well academically throughout college as well that can um, help you get more scholarships and get more um, aid while you are at university. Um, that certainly happened with me. Um, and so I think um, that helps. And for my master's, of course, because I was continuing at NYU, my department gave me, um, you know, 100% financial aid. Um, because of the work that I was doing. Um, and I, so I think that for me, again, it was academics, but it wasn't particularly determined by score. It was determined by my academic approach, my goals, my research area and focus. Um, so I think that those, the holistic part of your academics is also important to keep in mind rather than just being fixated on um, this score or that cutoff, I would say. Perfect. Thank you, Devanshi. So, so I'll be addressing some questions quickly from the chat box and then uh, moving on to Devanshi with one of the questions. So uh, I'm a UC student. Yes, UC is a test blind, but that does not mean uh, it would not affect uh, your admissions uh, to the UC simply because if a university wanted to go test blind, why are they giving you a place over there to fill in your SAT scores? If they, want, if they wanted you to not send your SAT scores, they should have just removed the, you know, the, the area where it said standardized test, give the breakup for your SATs, give the breakup for your ACTs. As long as it's there on your laptop screen, it's showing that you, you know, like you need to submit them. We believe that you require them. So if, if you have not given them, yes, it would be a disadvantage. But no, that is not the end. Like you know, it's it's not like it's going to uh, lead to a rejection. So there are multiple factors that uh, that come into uh, when you're talking about the college admissions. It is not just your SATs, not just your ACTs, not just your resume, not just your essays. It is a very well balanced application that admissions counselors are looking at. Uh, uh, moving on to a question for, for Devansh especially, if anyone got full marks, this is Abhishek, if anyone got full marks uh, in SAT, then can they get a 100% scholarship? Okay, so SATs for admissions are divided on a basis of like it's a range. It's not okay. So if you have full marks in SAT, that means that you'll get a full scholarship. It's a range. So and academics are not the only thing on which your scholarship is defined on. It's the extracurriculars. It's how you have written your application essay, your uh, scholarship essay, and so basically. Uh, for example, there might be a person who is at a fifteen ten or a fifteen twenty, and you have a 1600 on your SAT and he might receive more scholarship than you just because the rest of the factors are better even though you technically lie in the same range or in a similar range for a SAT and I think that should answer the question pretty well uh, there have been a lot of examples uh, where I've seen people with a lower SAT score have gotten more scholarship as compared to a person uh, with let's say a so I've seen people with a 1420 get a better scholarship with uh, as compared to a person with a 1480 or a 1490, because both of them essentially lie in the same range. It's just the essays and the extracurriculars that make a difference in the uh, long run or for the scholarship. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Devansh. So uh, Arjun, I have a question directed towards you from the chat box. Uh, do we need to apply for early action or regular decision? Uh, how? What is the difference? How does it help? To apply early is what is the difference between early action and early decision? If you can please. Elaborate. Early action is usually uh, applied for in somewhere on November. It's different for different university, but the general date is November first. And regular decision, uh, the application goes in on January first. The two kinds of early applications: one is early action, and one is early decision. Early action is when you apply to the school. Uh, at an earlier date as compared to the regular decision, but you, you're not forced to go, go to that school. As in, if you get in, you have a choice whether you want to attend that school or not. Early decision is uh, when you get into a school, you have to go to that school. So you're bound to go to that school. 
right? So you only apply for one uh, early decision school because uh, it's a binding choice. If you get into two early decision schools, you have a conflict. And that can't happen. So you only apply to one early decision school and as many early action schools and obviously as many regular decisions. Now, choosing between early action and regular decision, I think it's based on your interest. So most people who are keen on getting into one particular school or a few particular schools, they usually apply for early actions in those schools. Not every school has an early action, so be aware of that. There are different things known as restrictive early action also, uh, in which you only apply to one school uh, in early action also. You can't apply to other early action schools. The basic point is you need to be interested in a particular school for you to be uh, apply to apply early action. And the pool who apply in the early action is generally more competitive than the pool that applies for regular decision. Because many more people apply for regular decision as compared to early action. Uh, perfect. Uh, thank you, Arjun. So uh, briefly, could you please, please give like uh, an average score for your university? So, so Devanshi for NYU, what would be like an average SCT or an ACT score like, and an ACT score? And then Arjun and then Devan. Um, yeah, so um, I think that for NYU, um, the averages would, I think anything above um, 1450 would be um, ideal. Um, and I think that one thing to keep in mind is that because these statistics that you see on their website um, always keep changing and they always keep rising uh, every year. Um, so I think that and for NYU, um, you know, their, their acceptance percentage basically shrinks by about 3% every year. That's been the trends that we've been seeing um, since the last 10 years. So that's those fluctuations are something to keep in mind. So I think that um, anything above 1450, I think out of the, for the ACT, um, if, if that scored out of 36, then maybe something above like 33, 34 would be perfect. Um, but I think that it just keep in mind that the fluctuations will exist. Um, so if you are targeting for say 1450 on the SAT, um, and if that was the average um, this year, um, just, just keep in mind that um, it might be 1480 or 1500 to the next year coming. Um, and these numbers will obviously shift. So the, you should always train for the higher on that range. So aim for, you know, 15, 50 or something, like keep that 100 margin, but aim for the higher one. Um, and you're probably gonna, uh, if so even if you fall short, you're sort of safe. Um, just, just for full disclosure, my SAT score wasn't that great because of my math score. Um, it was 2060, that back then it was being evaluated out of 2400 but I still got in. Um, so I would definitely say that it's maybe, and it's maybe different for people applying to the humanities as well, because um, obviously for us, math um, does not really hold that much importance as reading and writing does. Um, so it might be different for different disciplines. And that's why I think that it, it is important to sort of carry on that department or a uh, discipline specific approach, even for undergrad, just so that you are um, at peace of mind. For Georgia Tech, for Georgia Tech, I think uh, the average score should be around 1450, 1460, same as NYU. I think yeah, fluctuations need to be kept in mind. Also consider that this is a pandemic year, so not many people will give will be giving SATs or they won't be able to give SATs. So fluctuations, the chance of fluctuations is much higher. So the average score might rise up. Okay, uh, for Indiana University, the average score I think would be a 1200, but um, for the Kelly School of Business, I feel the good average score would be a 1340. So um, let me elaborate a bit on how Indiana University's admission, like Kelly School of Business's admissions work. They have two filters essentially. One is getting into the university and the second filter is getting into the school. So uh, how so for getting into the school, you'll be needing a 1340 or more. But uh, if you do not have that, then you can definitely petition for Kelly. And um, they might take you in on the basis of your essay. And uh, just um, like if you're within the range of their accepted criteria, then you can uh, get in. 
if you do not get in through the petition admission uh, then you can still come to indiana university uh, do your first year over here ensure that you have a gp of more than 3.3 which is essentially uh, one or two b's not more than that and uh, you will uh, get into kelly um, i think there was also a question about average score of toefl and ielts so i think the ielts average score is 109 and uh, average ielts score is 7.5 yeah uh, okay there is one more is getting 1450 plus in second or third attempt of sat uh, okay so um, it honestly depends on what kind of universities you are targeting and what your overall profile looks like um there might be certain scenarios where you might be having a lower sat score but the rest uh, but you but your profile uh, in general like your extracurricular activities and your essays are spot on which um uh, will um uh, essentially make your profile more holistic and uh, increase your chances of getting in perfect thank you very much um so so i know there are a lot of unaddressed questions uh, which we would please uh, keep for the end because i know for a fact that a lot of them will be answered uh within this presentation in the next slide uh you know especially about the ambiguity because of covid 19 how uh would and would taking an act or act help you how would it uh, not help you uh what would the, what would be the weightage with regards to uh, your uh, extra curriculars and your academics so uh, first let's let's address the first question uh devanchi how uh much do you think like was sat or act or the standardized test weighed prior to your covid-19 situation and how do you think would it affect uh you know students uh, applying this year for college um yeah i think that um they definitely were um over emphasized in my opinion uh before the pandemic um but i think that there has been a growing criticism of standardized tests in general um so even before the pandemic a lot of graduate schools had actually done away with gre which is a completely different level of testing altogether than the sat um and um i for instance did not have to take the gre to apply to graduate school this year um but i i think that they are under a lot of growing criticism um more recently and after this pandemic for example the times higher education chronicle had an article published about how many universities might actually do away with it after the pandemic we don't know yet but that certainly seems to be something that a lot of um universities might lean towards um given the pandemic and given that the situation is far from over it will continue to affect people and um continue to affect people in terms of finances and access and safety and health um in many different countries um and geographies um so i think that that is something that will definitely change and fluctuate um but i think that the emphasis on sat act and also um just generally like gpa cutoffs etc has changed a lot um across universities um so yeah Uh, thank you devanchi uh, arjun what are your view points as to how uh, covid-19 has affected uh, the entire application uh, what do you think would be the weightage given to essays your resume and even to standardized tests i think essays and the story that you tell now through your application will play a much greater role now that tests are optional your predicted and your the scores you send are also probably not accurate as accurate as they might uh, want to be because exams are not being conducted and all so i think the essays will play the most major role as uh, far as most schools are concerned apart from that your extra curriculars and the the time you spent uh, the way you uh, spend the time during the pandemic or during lockdowns is what will, what should play a major role because many people might be watching netflix or idling around while you were probably doing something probably helping a community or probably reading up on uh, an engineering marvel or something or probably just fixing furniture around your house because there was no help around right so these small things they they, they should play a big role as uh, far as application after covid is concerned 
right so 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 uh, moving on from from uh, arjun's point of view so during the pandemic a lot of people have not been able to get uh, internships right and and have not been able to physically go do an internship devansh do you think you can still bag an internship and make a difference to the community do you think that will help uh, bolster your resume uh, what are your thoughts on that so this is like one of the few questions that i have received from multiple people on chat yeah so for internships um i feel there are a lot of volunteer positions available considering the current situation uh, with many of the ngos and also um, there are a lot of uh, like people are now able to hire more uh, staff since they need to work from home which are uh, since, so like office capacity is a thing which is no more a barrier for these companies and hence inter- bagging a internship has become easier in my opinion uh, but at the same time you would need to realize that you need to stay dedicated to the search uh, because there are a, there is a lot of competition for these positions and which is uh, where we are, like it'll be hard to stand out uh, like you need to have a proper resume you need to have um, a good interview prepped uh, like all the general questions tell me about yourself and things like that so that you can ensure that um, you are comfortable while you're taking the interview and you're able to hold up a conversation with the interviewer um i think there was also a um, question about how yeah how many internships did each uh, yeah so for me uh, i got two internships before i started studying at college and i'm uh, into like i'm interning right now as well um apart from that i think i also saw a question about research assistant positions so research assistant positions i think uh, is more about how you so you need to develop a contact uh, within universities by like let's say that you cold email a professor you start conversing with him or her and then you start uh, maybe getting on calls with them uh, sh- sharing your opinions and then you could maybe ask for a research assistant position if that might if you have developed that kind of a relationship with the professor over maybe a month two months three months and i think that's the best way to bag a research assistant position being an international student and not being at a college uh, at the current moment uh, perfect thank you thank you devansh so so again the research assistant position you will bag once you're in college and totally depends on your personal relationship with the professor going to office hours constantly uh, constantly shooting email doing well in the class aggressively participating in class activities will definitely uh, you know uh, uh, make you stand out a- as a candidate but that is totally unrelated to your college admissions because uh, uh i mean after all how would you get in touch with a professor without even going to a university well definitely through unilai uh, i mean in terms of mentors or mentors would be sharing those emails with you and help you formulate these cold emails but it is it is not like I, I, it's not a guarantee that you will get a reply from these professors because you know they they're very busy, busy with, with their own work and their own life uh we also had a lot of questions regarding what type of extracurricular activities uh i am a local uh, volunteer at the ngo in my locality is that a good extracurricular activity so uh, like we said at the beginning of uh, this this discussion a lot of the extracurricular activities are good like every extracurricular activity is good as long as you can relate it to your intended major in college and how has it shaped your life and how has it made you grow as a person so like devanshi gave a personal example that cooking italian food made her connect uh, with the culture we had a student a few years back who connected music to uh, math basically is wrote his entire essay about math behind music right we have we had some other student who related his uh, grandfather moving in from pakistan into how he wants to pursue uh, international relations and work with iranian refugees uh, coming to india so it totally does not matter what kind of extracurricular activities you have done or what kind of, what gravity you have done them at as long as you can relate them to your entire major in college and as long as you can write them in a very well formatted manner in your resume even if you have done something super interesting and you just write a, a, a very you know loose paragraph about it in your resume the counselor who is reading it will not get attracted to it so they're not going to pay much attention so bullet points is one key active voice is another key and the third uh, and the third key is a very well formatted resume basically uh, a- a- any other comments on this devanshi um no i don't 
think so. I think that covered it. Um, but yeah, I think that just um, doing anything um, will will help, especially at this point when you have limited opportunities and access. Um, I think just just making the best use of your time um, is going to help, um, and uh, just just being able to qualify and uh, and connect it to your larger goal and person. Um, so yeah. Perfect. Uh, thank you. So, so uh, that basically concludes uh, the topics of discussion for the panel. And uh, at night, I now like to uh, keep the mic open uh, for people to address questions to uh, panel members directly or to ask questions. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, like to the entire panel. So, I mean, uh, you, you, you just take on the mic. Or, or how about you? Or how about you just write yes on chat? And then uh, you know, like like who, uh, we, we we can just go order wise in an orderly fashion. So who wants to go first? Can just write yes or like one, and then, then we yeah, can okay. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Am I audible? Yes. Okay. Okay. So I have a doubt. Say, um, and the thing is that I haven't done any sort of math for the past four years. And the thing with this is like, I don't even want to apply to colleges with a degree that needs math. But now giving the SATs in such a short period of time, I'm already in 12th grade. And now everybody is telling me to give the SATs. And it's, it's kind of very like difficult for me since I haven't done anything in math for like a really long time. And I feel like I have a lot to offer to colleges in other backgrounds when it comes to like extracurriculars or everything I have like, like I made sure that I have done a lot of those things. And so is it like still really necessary for me to like get into a good college with like a scholarship because I can't really like afford it in the first place. So yeah, that's it. Now, Devansh, would you like to answer that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so there are a lot of liberal arts colleges and uh, there are in fact Ivy leagues as well, which ask, so like maths is not, the, okay, maths is important for people who are going into STEM related fields or people are, who are going to fields which actually require analytics or maybe uh, some kind of financial data modeling and you need, you need to realize how uh, things work uh, using maths. Uh, for people who are oriented towards art or something which is not math essentially, I feel like uh, I've seen people apply for um, arts as a major and they have been required to send out a portfolio, which is where you stand out. So I think SAT would be more of a, a cutoff criteria for people uh, applying to arts related schools and uh, portfolio is where you will stand out. Uh, I've like uh, Indiana University has Jacob School of Music, which is I think one of the top three schools for music in, in the US. And uh, they do not usually have a great SAT criteria. It is the portfolio and the audience, like and the auditions, uh, which they host, uh, or maybe like a video portfolio of you singing your instrument, or uh, uh, yeah. So that's where you can stand out. So for this kind of a situation, SATs would be more of a cutoff uh, parameter, as I mentioned earlier, and uh, you would be able to create your impact and show your uh, personality or show your passion or focus towards your particular field using your portfolio. Thank you. Thank you so much. That cleared up a lot. So I still have to give it right as a criteria. Like I need to like still uh, give it right. I think that as of right now, we do not uh, like most of the universities have waived the SAT requirement, but it still helps you uh, put uh, like put yourself on a platform when you're being compared to a kid from uh, Pakistan, Bhutan, South Korea, North Korea, um, China, because these are the people that we'll be competing with. And um, if you're not on that platform, that kind of puts you on a disadvantage since they can't compare you with the other person. So they don't know how to assess your ability or how will you fit in the college. And, and also, right. Thank you so much. Yeah. Also, Rishita, it helps because uh, it just shows your inclination and how serious you're about your college applications and that you've gone the extra mile despite the pandemic. So, uh, yeah, you should. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, uh, Devanshi, uh, I think you're, you're up next with your question. Yes, sir. Actually, I have completed my 12th this year 
and i want to pursue my further bachelor's in astronomy in top university if i have not done like in my resume is not so strong if i start with an internship and write a good essay is there any chance to get into a good university uh devanshi would you like to address this sorry uh, would you like to address this devanshi um yeah i think that it's um i think it's it's um again like these are very competitive schools that we're we're sort of talking about um and uh i think it's like um i think it's it's how um one qualifies as I, if i have a good essay or i i don't think that it's um it's really like there's any guarantee in this process at all i think you just have to see it as a process um but if you've you finished it um you finished your your 12th and you know you are uh looking forward to applying i would say that again whatever you can control at this time um do it to the best and and give it give it a good few months um like to to write even an essay um i i think you need 3 or 4 months to write a good essay um so i think that definitely give every component time as much as you would give um academics or standardized testing and gpas time um so give all of the other components time but again when when it comes to highly competitive universities that are going through as many changes as the rest of us um there is no guarantee about what might work and what might not work um because it's highly individual i'd say um so i i would definitely not go from will i get into this um university at this point i would rather see it as a process is if i do this this um and this can i do i have a shot um so definitely keep the end goal in mind but um do not make it that restrictive for your own self and see it as a process that you need to work on okay and i have another one question like uh, i want to ask like if i want to have an internship under any professor which kind of emails like how can i write it so pro- profoundly that they can select me for the a research work so so i'd like to answer that uh, uh, devanshi there's only two words for it it depends and you like like it, it depends from case to case or which professor you are addressing what type of personality personality type are you addressing are you addressing an intj are you addressing an ep you know are you addressing an extrovert are you addressing a professor who does not like emails likes face to face conversations that plays an important role so knowing the professor plays an important role uh while writing those emails so that's why it's a very uh, subjective question which which we cannot answer uh, I, i hope that helps uh, moving on uh, uh, alankrit uh, i think uh, you're up next with the question Yeah, hello everyone. I started preparing for my SAT last week. I have started my preparation now. The first test I gave, I scored about seven fifty in maths and about five hundred in English. I don't know how to improve English. First, some things on that means my English is is not good at all. My maths is good, but this was my first test as such as practice test. but i see that english is not going good so how should i look forward to it uh, arjun would you like to take that yeah so uh, i think the first thing you should do is probably if you are able to identify patterns so if you are able to and sort of analyze your test you should do that on your own if you're not able to do that get someone else probably your english teacher in school or someone do that for you work with him or her on uh areas that you lack in so english uh, the writing section is very specific i mean you need need to know a few technical uh, details like where to put a comma or where to put an exclamation where not to put one so to override that you need to work with a professional if you're not able to do do it on your own and the reading as far as the reading section is concerned you need to read a bit so if english is not good you should start reading more books start yeah. and then work your way up it'll take a bit of time but that's how it works practice and that is what makes english perfect on an sat okay and my other query is related to something called as edx i was doing a course on edx 
I was doing it about two months back. Then I discontinued because of my APs, etc. Other tests. I the topic of that was Intro to Computer Science by Harvard. I can continue that from now, from the time that I left it. My progress is saved there. It takes a lot of time. Means there are about nine weeks to go still. I I agree that we are doing some good projects there, and I have gotten in touch with the professor also. David Mullen, he's the top faculty at computer science from Harvard through DMs on Instagram. And should I continue that course because it, one, it's taking a lot of time. Two, I don't know if I should do that. If it will be a good thing in my application process. Uh, look, uh, if you like CS and if you like the course. Then you should definitely go forward with it. I mean, I know what course you're talking about. I've done that course. It was my first uh, intro point to CS. Right? Yeah. So, I know. I I know a great lot of CS. I have done about five to six hackathons. I have made projects. That's something like I just want to say. I know it. I was doing the thing they are teaching there. Fifty percent of that I fifty to seventy percent of that I already know. But I need to pass that. I need to go through those videos. I need to do those projects there. It is taking a lot of time. Means that was one big big concern that I was looking through. Means do they think that this person has done this course? He knows better than this one. Um, if I can, sorry, sorry. Um, just want to interject that um, I did a couple of those edX courses in high school as well. Um, and you know they're. They're great if you want an introduction to your major. Um, they're great if you want to get in touch with a professor, which also I did. But then when I asked that professor, um, Helen Dundler at Harvard, like, oh, you taught a course um, on English poetry. She said they don't help with admissions at all. So if your goal is to do edX courses, to put something on your resume that might potentially help with your um, uh, admissions, they don't help with admissions at all. Um, they might help you get in touch with a professor and get to know more about your major, but that's it. And that's the limit of them. So I would say that if you're doing it um, just for that, it's okay. But if you're doing it for admissions and from that point of view, they're not helpful at all. And no university considers them legitimate because there are ways that you can actually score well on them without learning anything. Okay, thanks a lot for that concern. And another thing was that when should I start my essay preparation in specific? Like I will be getting into Men con conversation with my mentors, but when did you start? Like now, I want to start. I have started jotting down some points that I want to add in my essays, and when that's when is the right time? Four four letters A S A P. The more you do, more you edit, the more a uh, number of like you know brainstorming your sessions you've had with your mentor, the better chances you have of framing a better essay. I mean, if if uh, if you think you're gonna wait till the end and then. One night you're just gonna, uh, you know, have this uh, uh, thing that okay, okay, now now is the right time to start. No, it's not. Start ASAP uh, so that you can, you know, have more edits and have more valuable insights on your essays. And uh, uh, I hope that answers all your questions, Alankit. Can we uh, move on to the next person? Yeah, one more, th one just one more thing that yeah. does these class scores matter? Like my twelfth grade and how much? See, I will be giving a predicted score to my university. Does these universities even check that, like this score, this person got a just an 80, but he mentioned 95. This person got an 70, but he mentioned 90, and then they remove you from the university or something like that. What's the what's the concern here? So, so, so Devansh Arjun, like, who would want to take back Devansh? Bye. So, um, predicted scores are okay. So, if you are not sending a predicted score, then they assume a certain amount of score based on your previous stats. And if you are sending out a predicted score, then it is basically like okay. And giving predicted scores are usually in range. And then the university adds on a five or like five percent margin both way. Definitely not on the upper end, but on the lower end. And if you score lower than that, then I think the university. Would definitely ask you for a very reasonable explanation as to why did you uh, score lower, and 
if they're not satisfied with your explanation, then they'll definitely take it back because it's essentially um, so. How university looks at these courses, like if your scores are going up, then that's definitely good because they know that okay, you're more focused on things. But if your uh, if your scores are going down, then uh, they look at it as a detrimental factor onto your uh, application as a whole. So um, yeah, like, yeah, scores are something which uh, you. Shouldn't play around with is what I would like to end with. Arjun, would you like? Yeah. To yeah. yeah so to add on to that, uh, there's another question on conditional and unconditional offers. So I'll just sort of incorporate that. Uh, most offers in the US are unconditional, so they give you offers based on a predicted score, obviously. But with COVID and the pandemic this year, uh, probably they might give. Some less weightage to your uh, scores. No one knows. I mean, it's a personalized uh, application process. No one knows exactly what will happen. So there's no okay. short, short formula to that. And as far as unconditional scores, uh, unconditional offers are concerned, uh, most offers from the U.S. universities are unconditional. But if you fail to meet your uh, predicted score by a huge margin, they might ask mm -hmm. you for an explanation. And if you are unable to provide a satisfactory explanation, they might put you on probation or they might not give you admission. I mean, I know a few people who did not get in uh, because they scored significantly lower on their actual test as compared okay. to what Okay, uh, perfect. So, so Alankit, now we're going to move on to Karthik. I know you're, you're a, a student with us. So uh, uh, you can ask those questions to your mentors as well. Uh, moving yeah, on to, yeah. to Karthik. Uh, Karthik, what was your question again? Thank you. Um, I actually have two questions. So I'm applying for computer science major. And uh, my first question is, is doing internships that are direct not are not directly related to my major. Um, like in my case, I'm doing a research assistantship with a professor from PGI in uh, microbiology. And I'm doing a tech journalism um, internship in a startup, in a tech startup, in a journalism startup. So do these still add value to my application? Uh, would you like to take that on, Arjun, since it's CS? Yeah. Um, so it depends. I mean, if you learn something significant or if you consider that to be significant in your life and you talk about it in your application, it will definitely add value to your application. If you think it's just as part-time or pastime that you are doing it just for the sake of it, you will not be able to reflect in your application as well. And then it'll sort of play a very minor role in your application because universities just try to uh, consider an application as a whole. They don't see separate parts. There's no part of for extracurriculars, right? There's no set standard. Yeah. Right. And just, just adding on to what Arjun said, so, so you can define your pillars in the beginning and then pivot to those pillars. So for example, if you're applying for business, one of the pillars would be marketing or uh, business related activities. The second pillar would probably be leadership or debating, which are, which is showcasing your you know leadership skills uh, when you're applying to colleges. So uh, uh, does that answer your question, Karthik? Yeah. Um, the second question that I had was, um, so I've, I've spent the past year working on a lot of extracurricular. So for, for example, I've, I've done multiple internships, like. In, in CS, I've done an internship with Intel. I've done an, I've done an internship with uh, another tech startup. And I've, I was, I've spoken on different panels, like national level symposium panels, like with Intel, with NUS. But because of all of the extracurricular, my, um, my, my final scores, like my school scores have taken a little bit of a hit. They've gone down to like 80 to 83%. So does that really, affected a lot or is it not really that bad because the extracurricular is fixed with it? So open mic for any, any of the panelists, uh, whoever wants, wants to take, take that. Um, yeah, I think that definitely um, academics taking a little bit of a dip would be um, a little difficult to um, to handle in terms of the admissions, but I do think that doing a variety of internships really, really helps um, because you will be doing a lot of 
you will be doing a variety of coursework in college and you will be doing a lot. And I just think that having a diversity of experience really does help, um, especially if you've, um, if you're able to, to explain well um, how that has helped you. Um, so yeah, I think that, I think it then, if, if something takes a dip or if something um, is a bit shaky, um, the best that you can do is explain why that is so, if there are circumstances, um, you have that extra space, but also um, just explain the circumstances, but also just use your extracurriculars and capitalize on that um, to, to explain why. But I, I would definitely say that diversity of experience really helps for um, any kind of admissions um, uh, and if, if you're able to explain, um, so yeah. Uh, perfect, uh, Karthika, does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, perfect. Moving on, uh, uh, Nivedita, uh, you're up next. Uh, yeah, thank you for giving me this chance. So my doubt is I just entered my 12th standard and in my whole high school, I had never concentrated on extracurriculars as I have no idea that to get into good universities, I need extracurriculars. So I came to know about it like recently about two months. So what if I take a gap year and then concentrate and focus on my extracurriculars and go for next year application? Is it beneficial or is it suggested? Uh, uh, so going into a gap or relatively big because um, it it can work either way. It can go really well and it can go really bad. Because for a gap year, it's basically more. Yeah, it's around three sixty five days or more that you need to define what you did and how you did it. So if you are planning to take a gap year, all power to you. But going into a gap year, plan out all the things that you want to do and figure out things. Uh, figure out how to do them as well. Because um, if you're not able to hit the target right, or if you're not able to get the most out of the gap year, then it might be a bit of a problem. Like maybe taking solo trips would also be a good idea, but okay, it's COVID-19. So think about it twice or thrice before taking a trip. Um, and um, like then taking, my, uh, might be like uh, starting your uh, own blog or a YouTube channel, or just, you know, sharing out your opinions on something that interests you it might be uh engineering articles might be movies might be um different colleges that uh, you have like different um how do i say different cities that you have experienced or different uh literatures that you have gone through um and there's a lot that you could explore on the internet and share your opinions about i i personally feel that um even though people don't pay a lot of attention to these kind of creative and uh, rigorous activities, they essentially play an important role because it shows that you're a self-starter. And apart from that, it also shows that, okay, uh, you're trying to share your knowledge with the others, which uh, I, I personally believe that colleges would appreciate. Perfect, thank you very much. Uh, does that answer your question, Avedra? Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Perfect, uh, Akshay, you're up next. Oh yeah, thanks uh, for giving the opportunity. I have the question that I have done a certain amount of social work and some courses related to my field, which is CS, means courses like languages. I have learned some languages uh, like, uh, and that's, uh, and done some of the internship of one to two months. And I like reading uh, books, uh, which is kind of a mix of all the things. So should I put everything in my, in my AC or should I skip some of the things? Okay, so, so, so basically uh, you're asking if uh, whatever you have done, if you should uh, elaborate all that in your essay or uh, if you should, uh, you know, like, like, is that your question? Yeah, that's the question. So uh, does anyone want to like take, take it head on or uh, uh, any of the panelists? Or I, I can go as well. I mean, up to you guys. Um, okay, so for essays, um, I think 
essays are better when focused on to a particular journey or a particular incident or a particular situation that you might have experienced academically or through your extracurricular activities um if you try to cram everything onto your essay it will lead to practically no um final goal or no moral of the story kind of thing which would uh, then make it difficult for firstly the reader to absorb so much information and then make an informed decision and secondly it would um make it difficult for you as a writer to uh, define the personality trait or the things that you have learned very difficult because the more incidents or more situations you have to connect the more difficult it is to find commonalities between all of them and uh, figure out okay this is what i'm going to conclude on okay uh, and i want to ask one thing uh, that i have a business of affiliate marketing uh, but it's new not uh, some older i have just started uh, before a month so uh, should i put it uh, Uh, on my application, or should I leave it uh, uh, like that? What should I do with that? They launch anyone? Yeah. Okay. So I worked with a client, I think, who had a slime barrel uh, creation business. Like she was creating slime barrels, okay. and um, so what we did with. that business was we definitely mentioned it on the resume but for i think a university specific essay we had actually uh, it, uh, she was applying for, uh, to a business school and being an entrepreneur at such a uh, young age is uh, extremely uh, unique uh, so what we did was we defined all the revenues and uh, shared the journey of the business and what all she got to learn and uh, got to learn throughout uh, the journey and apart from that uh, she was also able to um share how uh, this is how she developed her interest in business so uh definitely um i would say yes you could include it in your resume and you could uh, also maybe write essays about that um a good addition to that would be def- uh, keep developing the business and uh, make sure that you have all the key performance indicators uh, highlighted as you uh, progress so that you can share your journey in a more uh, statistical uh, point of view to the um uh, reader Okay, thanks. Right, and and also Sakshi, uh, just just to build on that, even if you've done multiple extracurricular activities, you, what matters more as Devan suggested is is the journey. What is what was the outcome? What was the result? Uh, but also, let's say uh, if you're writing about running a marathon, or let's say if you're writing about uh, uh, you know like doing coding, and then you're applying for business, uh, that is totally unrelated. If you cannot relate an activity to your intended major in college. don't write about it just because you know because it's it's nice for example i've seen people write about some kind of campaigns international uh, activities that they've done which are totally unrelated to their major only because they they want to show that they you know that they've uh, like you know they've been like i think it's it's a very prominent defining factor factors in their life and they want to showcase this uh, on their common app essay but that's a very bad advice what would be more important is how your journey went how did you grow up from you know uh, through that experience and uh what was the final outcome of that experience so so i hope that helps oh okay thanks right. yeah uh moving on lavanya i think uh, you have a question my question is for divyanshi that she told her like really interesting story about the 16th century book so i want to ask her that her story was like real or she made up the story Sorry, uh, it was real. Um, I wrote everything honestly on my, um, yeah, com- common application in my college application. So yeah. Okay, and my next question was that uh, for Devyansh, that uh, how did he like he got the internship pro- under professor in India or in foreign country as well as what project, uh, what was the project he got like, uh, what was the topic. of research um uh, so i actually did not get a uh, internship under a research professor i had um a prof uh, a internship with a factory and the second one was with a um educational startup 
and uh, like both of them were uh, due to the extensive conversations that i had had with both the um, with the owner of the factory and uh, and the manager of the factory and for the edtech startup i had uh, long conversations with the founder and uh, how did he uh, basically like i honestly wanted to learn about his journey and how did he end up uh, starting this uh, company so um, that's how i landed at the internship what were your topics my topics uh, so basically for uh, the factory i was a management intern and for um, the edtech startup i was a corporate innovation intern where i was working on uh, like it was a i think i don't know if you might have heard of it it's called doubtnut so uh, where we they basically create a, like you send out a uh, the picture of a question and then they send you a video solution of the question or a similar question that they might have already answered so uh, my take on that was i had to present a proper uh, method of how to uh, innovate it further how to add more features onto the app and uh, what might work what might not work and uh, how to essentially predict it so um, there have been a lot of changes like um, i personally suggested i think it was the google cloud which had machine learning capabilities and uh, uh, so essentially you sent out a picture it could uh, read the uh, question as a whole and then it would uh, automatically analyze okay this is a uh, like similar question to the picture that you had sent and then it would uh, shoot out the video solution of that okay thank you so much okay uh, Thank you, Lakshya. Thank you, Devansh. Uh, next, we have Abhishek. Uh, he has a question. Uh, uh, I think he's offline. Uh, Abhishek, are you here? Uh, okay. No. Good evening, sir. Good evening, all. Yes, sir. I want to ask something. Uh, that if any student are uh, more possessive and uh, curious to study in us university uh, but its financial condition is not good then with the help of uh, the scholarship and the financial aid which will provided by the university with the having seen their ac or any kind of uh, work uh, then he can complete their dreams or not so 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 uh, the question is a little ambiguous so so you are asking that uh, if the financial situation of a student is not nice uh to what extent would a university offer that aid is, is that your question yes sir uh so uh again it depends but but but, but, the, but the question i i think I, i'd like devanshi to answer uh this better because um yeah i think again it it's it really does depend because i think it um depends also on how much money the university itself has uh whether you're applying to a public school a private school which kind of private school you're applying to uh what kind of college you're applying to um obviously some universities have more money to extend as financial aid than others um so definitely um i think that's something you have to narrow down your search to um and and also again some universities might be some areas might be more expensive to live in so i for instance live in new york city which is a very expensive city to live in um so a financial aid obviously does cover uh those costs but i do have to figure out other ways to manage my my daily expenses so that is also something to consider um maybe you might like being in a closed campus where you have access to everything so you don't do not have to spend that much extra plan that much um to um to spend but um obviously so that's also something to consider um and um but but yeah it really does depend on the university it really does also depend on their international student policy and how much they extend to international students um for instance my funding also comes from my department which is more hospitable to international students most of my department is international because it's a comparative literature department um so those are also things to con to consider um how much funding the department has in the university and for international students and where it's located and what kind of university it is uh thank you divanshi just to add on to that for uh, uh, abhishek so it also matters as to uh, you know like how you fill out your css profile because you have to show clearly and state clearly that this is why i cannot afford this education over here thus please give me uh, extend me this kind of aid and this kind of grant 
uh and with, with that i would also like to add that some to some universities apply with need based scholarship but some also keep with need blind so that uh, you know you you have like uh, you can even make universities compete so we had a student uh, like a year back who basically got a 80% scholarship from drexel and got a 60% scholarship from dartmouth and emailed dartmouth saying well you know drexel is offering me a 80% scholarship i really want to come to dartmouth because the curriculum is you know so amazing please can you match the scholarship requirement of extend me a better scholarship and guess what dartmouth gave him a 115% scholarship so because on often universities also have egos right how can drexel offer more scholarship than i can when i'm a better ranked university than drexel right so so these things also play uh, yes an important role okay sir sir i want to uh, one question more that the scholarship which is provided by any university uh, whether if uh, anyone want to the just like uh, bs in physics uh, just like a four year take courses then the until the four year the scholarship will be provided or uh, the scholarship with uh, only for the one year or uh, first semester you can say so like till what extent would the scholarship be extended is that your question like when and how and how much yes sir so so again it depends it depends on the offer that you receive a uh, university can give you like 400000 dollars and abhishek spend it uh, whenever you want they can give you 100000 dollars and say whenever you want to spend it spend it they can put a, uh, a thing where they say that okay 80% of your tuition fees is covered every year they can say okay you only have 40000 dollars uh, spend it in your first year second year third year fourth year however you want it. so so it totally again it depends on the kind of offer letter that you're getting from the university okay sir thank you okay perfect so so we had a question from sivya now i don't know if she's here uh, if you're applying in the engineering department of a top notch liberal arts college uh, do you have any advantage of that now this question is a little ambiguous uh, engineering department of a top notch liberal arts college hmm. and it's it's unique uh, do you do you guys any have any like i don't know what is she trying to ask sivya are you here i think it means uh, if you apply to a college if you apply to a course where the college is not specialized in you have a better chance oh I okay think. so so basically if you're applying uh, to school of uh, like the college of Liber uh, arts and sciences instead of school of engineering and then probably changing your major or uh, you know uh, for the ease of admission i right. think i think that's that's a very uh, a, a unique way to look at it as well uh, because college of arts and sciences is like in the middle of all the other colleges because it, it's kind of it kind of has some business courses some design courses some uh, uh engineering courses so it coincides with other colleges yes it is a good way to look at it but then it totally again depends on the resume kind of resume that you're making and the kind of applic overall application that you that you're you know trying to portray you can't uh, say that i want to apply for dance and then have a lot of business related activities uh, in your resume nor can you do that to stanford you want to apply for dance to harvard you want to apply for business and to uh, yale you want to apply for law because because then how are you going to like you know what are you going to focus on your common app essay like like what points are you going to focus on your common app essay how would you let your resume flow uh, so so i think this concludes all the questions that we have uh, devansh devanshi and arjun do you want to give any uh, like you know uh, end notes any funny experiences uh, from the university uh, hello yeah. sorry can i just ask one question can i ask uh, sure sure please uh actually i am applying for cs course uh, in university and uh, after having the degree i want to start a business in the tech or software industry so should i apply for cs course or should i go for business school it depends on what you are good at or what you are inter more interested in right now so i mean you can do a cs course and then start a business in cs you can obviously do that you can do a business course but then after a business course you won't have the technical knowledge a cs student might have okay it totally depends on what you want you want to do with that business okay It's too early i would say honestly in your okay. journey okay thanks okay perfect so, so i think no more questions so uh, we just like to conclude uh, with some unique and funny experiences within colleges to give you a better insight as to what being a college student in the us uh, feels like and how is every university unique 
So I, I'll start with my experience. So, so Davis uh, has approximately 80, 90,000 bikes. And, uh, and I remember my, my first week in class, I did not know who my professor was. And uh, there was this guy who was parking his bike. And uh, there was only one spot left. And I just went to put my bike right next to him and double locked it. And I, when I entered the class, I realized he was the professor. And, and, and his, in his first, like, you know, uh, first week, he, 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 told, uh, he was telling about his experience as to how there was this one very rude student who kind of interlocked his bike. And that was me. I knew it was me. So I kind of just hid in the corner the entire quarter in order to avoid, uh, avoid having like a one-on-one -on -one discussion with the professor. So, uh, yeah. I mean, whoever wants to go next can go. I mean, no pressure, but yeah. Um, okay, so um, uh, the unique info, uh, experience for me was, um, so there's a show water fountain where it's basically a fountain and the tradition at Indiana University is that uh, people jump into it. Usually after football games, maybe after graduating during your freshman year. So um yeah i have done that once during my freshman year and that was one of the most unique experiences that i've ever had like anywhere right so so i think i think the seven people who are here right now are very lucky because they can incorporate these things to the indiana specific essay right <laughs> yeah uh, arjun devanshi how about you guys I had this professor for my first semester who would, so I had an online semester. So that professor would send us, like whenever someone didn't attend a class or something, he would send memes rather than any text message or anything to each one individually saying why, and those are funny memes. I mean, I can't recall all of them, all of them. And some I can't say really explicitly, but in the, the pretty fun experience, I mean, I wouldn't think a professor has any means to not attending class. Devanshi, I think you're the last one left in the panel. Yeah, um, I don't know. I think it's hard to pinpoint one unique experience because I, um, I mean, I think it's it's a privilege to live in New York City. Um, I would just say that um, every evening I would go to a different cultural show, which thankfully New York is opening up so we can do that again. But it's just the celebrity run-ins on campus. So I've run into Meryl Streep, Hillary Clinton, um, and uh, you know, yesterday, Richard Gere, Alec Baldwin. Um, these are all people that live nearby um, and that you keep running into. Um, my other experience was also seeing Shah Rukh Khan on campus and I was just totally floored. Um, so I, I think it's it's experiences like that and then you actually get to meet these people. Um, so once I realized I was in a theater and I was actually sitting um, next to, um, you know, uh, Jonah Hill, who's one of my favorite actors and uh, was just having a conversation with him and caught a coffee with him later. Um, so I think that it's um, experiences like that and uh, the fact that my writer is actually a pseudonymous writer. She writes under a pseudonym, no one knows who she is. But then I actually got to take a class with he, the person who is presumed to be the real her and the, her spouse. And so I was trying to, me and my professor were sort of trying to figure out if that's actually them or not. But I got to take a class with them. I lived with them last month in their home in Rome. Um, so I think experiences like that really define, I'm, I'm getting to meet people that I um, read and learn from. So, yeah. Right. Uh, uh, thank you, Devanshi. Uh, thank you, Devanshi, and thank you, Arjun. Uh, so much that concludes the panel discussion. If you have any more questions or if you think, uh, let's say you have some questions after the panel that you were not being able to ask, you can definitely log on to uh, unitherlai.com and just, uh, you know, shoot your questions for our advisors to answer there. And you can even schedule uh, your uh, like one-on-one -on -one meetings with them. Uh, thank you so much, guys. It was great uh, having you all. Thank you, Devanchi. Thank you, Devanchi. And thank you, Arjun. Uh, uh, the next panel discussion is going to be about universities in Canada. So uh, see you guys then.